All right, so one question my patients ask me is, well, but I've been told that I need to eat like this, or I read this book and it seemed like that was a good idea, or my friend lost 20 pounds doing X. And so one of the services that I explain to people is like, I want to be able to explain the differences between all the different diets and why some things might have worked back when you were 20 and why things might not be working now. So one of the first things I want to deal with is the low fat, high carb understanding. So, so what I was saying, you know, we had this, this government policy of low fat and, you know, I welcome you to look out the window and see how well it's working <laughs> because the, it actually has a name called the Snackwell effect because if you think back, remember the Snackwell cookies is because they were cookies that were made with low fat and so then people ate like lots of them. So the, and then, you know, that people didn't, um, a couple things happen when you don't have fat and things and you're not satiated, you're not full. Fat is what has things have you be satiated. So the problem is, is if you take fat out of things and people tend to eat a lot of them. And then, uh, you know, carbs weren't really differentiated. If you look at the, at the pyramid for the food pyramid for the USDA food pyramid at the bottom it says 6 to 11 servings of grains but it doesn't actually differentiate what that looks like so it could be a snack well cookie so the snack well effect describes how people over ate on carbs because it didn't really balance anything out and so what occurs then in a low fat high carb diet is people will um, technically especially in a low fat diet technically be eating less calories but they will and people will lose weight on that there's no question about it but it's not a, um, a diet that you can keep going for a long period of time as you know most people who have done low fat diets they've lost weight and then they gain it back and they do this yo-yo dieting which has a couple different problems one the one of the big ones is that you can actually damage your metabolism doing that like permanently damage it the other thing is that if you eat low fat, you're actually not able to get any of the fat soluble vitamins that you really need to have, like vitamin D is a really good example that's found in fat. So Weight Watchers is another good example too. So Weight Watchers has, I love Weight Watchers for the fact that it teaches people portion control because we have no idea what portions are. So it's really helpful for that. But the problem is, is that it um, does not differentiate anything having to do with carb intake. So technically you could use all of your points and eat a brownie at the end of the day and go for long periods of time without eating and no differentiation between like what would be good and healthier foods. Then a lot of people have, you know, tried to eat more healthy and they they come in and it's like, but I'm only eating good carbs. You know, I had a vegetarian couple who came in and they, they had eaten, you know, they ate like oatmeal in the morning and then they would have like, or kashi, they'd have like a good green cereal and then they would have like whole wheat pitas and brown rice with vegetables and all of that. Like they were eating good carbs. Now, technically, yes, good carbs are healthier than bad carbs like white flour, white sugar, things like that. But a good carb, and a good carb has more um, fiber in it and more nutrients than you know brown rice versus white rice. But the problem is, is that both of those still cause an insulin surge. So when you're when you're working in a blood sugar model and you're trying to not trigger insulin, then you don't want to have really much of either one of those because both of those will cause an insulin surge. The same thing goes on with, with a glycemic index. People will say, okay, well, I'm trying to eat low glycemic. That's not bad. The problem is, is glycemic index is a little bit um, not clear for people because they'll say, well, I, you know, I saw that carrots and beets are high glycemic vegetables. Well, yes, technically, because they sort of break down into sugar. But my first problem with that is that, like, I can't get people to eat enough vegetables anyway. Why would I take out things like carrots and beets, which have an enormous amount of nutrients to them? The other thing is, is the glycemic index changes if you eat those foods with other foods. So if you eat, like, vegetables with butter, for instance, or you add a protein to the meal, it changes the glycemic index of those foods. So yes, you can technically get a, you know, a table that lists low glycemic and high glycemic foods, but if you eat other things with them, it changes the, where that would be on the table. So it's not fully accurate the way that it is, the way that it is then either. Now, Atkins was, um, people don't realize this, but Ad the Atkins diet was actually designed for morbidly obese people in the hospital who were too weak to get out of bed to exercise. And so they would eat an Atkins diet, and what Atkins was recommending was getting on a ketosis diet, like getting your system into ketosis, which is a way where your body converts uh, into burning fat and as a fuel instead of using glucose, which is what most people are using right now. And it worked for morbidly obese people in the hospital, and then it worked when they took it outside of that. It worked for like thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people who took it on, you know, in the normal population. The problem is, is that the Atkins diet is, a, is very hard to maintain. So staying in a ketogenic um, state, if you have like 
a couple of bites of bread, you're out like that. Like it takes nothing to get out of the ketogenic state. So people simply found it hard to maintain. They were successful at it, but it was hard for them to maintain. So the, the, you know, what we do here in this office is we don't recommend necessarily Atkins, but we do recommend something that has a lot lower carbs than what normal diets, you know, normal diets look like in this country. And actually, before I go farther, I'd like to clarify, like, the difference between, like, a diet and a lifestyle. Like, I'm not interested in people dieting. You know, we've had plenty of diets, and lots of them have, you know, worked, and they'll work for a short period of time, but I'm really interested in educating people about lifestyle. So that's my intention in explaining the background of this. So then, the, you know, another diet that was taken on was South Beach. So South Beach is, um, was sort of getting closer to that, to something relatively healthy, and it was having people eating, you know, lean meats and then, you know, good carbs, things like that. The reason it doesn't work for some people is because the good carbs or, you know, the more whole grains that people were eating, the problem was is that for people who have insulin resistance, it still causes a huge amount of insulin problems for them. So even those... The, the limited carbohydrates they had in that diet was still too much for most people. And the other thing is, is it recommended artificial sweeteners. Now, a little side here on sweeteners. So artificial sweeteners, like if you drink a diet soda, is, um, yeah, there's the whole chemical aspect about why that's not healthy for you, but just from a blood sugar perspective, artificial sweeteners, because your system is so trained for sweet, an artificial sweetener will still cause an insulin surge. This is why the studies show that high diet soda intake causes insulin resistance, is because of that. So anytime you have some type of artificial sweetener, you have something that's sort of using something other than sugar but still tastes sweet, still causes a problem. And then sometimes people will say, well, what about like agave syrup? Because agave syrup is, is like a natural alternative. It doesn't really matter, actually. One, it's still sweet, so it's still going to cause you an insulin surge. But the second thing is, and people don't often know this, is that the actual agave plant is not sweet enough. So what they do is they either boil the plant down so that it gets more concentrated in, in sweetener, or they use some enzymes. This is the raw form. Is When they don't cook it, the raw form is they add some enzymes to get that concentration down. And then either way of those, our agave syrup then is even more concentrated in sweetener than high fructose corn syrup. It is actually actually more damaging than high fructose corn syrup. And high fructose corn syrup, also enormously damaging, but there's plenty of information out there on that as well. Stevia is so far the only sweetener that's been shown that doesn't cause an, uh, an insulin surge. And, you know, some people don't like necessarily how it tastes. Some people have some digestive distress with that. You know, when I'm, when I'm talking to people about this, what I'm, I'm trying to have them realize is that your system is really trained for sweet. What I want you to actually start to realize is how much train for it and see if we, there's any way that you can start interrupting that, like not having so much like not having so much insulin sugar, but simply also not having so much sweet in your diet, even if it is something that doesn't have calories. The sweet, even though it's not you know a, you know even if it's glu not glucose and it's like an artificial sweetener, it still causes a problem. What you're trying to do is ultimately train your way away from sweeteners.